It's so exciting to see you all here. Um, I'm Kathy Tuttle from Wallingford Greenways, trying to make Seattle-wide Greenways a reality. Um, and I wanted to introduce our great guests tonight. Thank you so much for coming to uh, Finney, all the way from Queen Anne. <laughs> Uh, so this is Peter Han here, uh, just to my right, and Dong Ho Chang, uh, just to Peter's right. And Peter, as I said, lives on Queen Anne uh, with uh, his wife, uh, Mary McCumber, who's probably more politically connected than you are, even. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. And uh, <laughs> what can you say? Well, you have a microphone. You can talk. <laughs> Uh, but Peter does uh, control a uh, $12 billion transportation budget and oversees a staff of 750 people, so he's pretty connected, too. Um, his continued leadership has been instrumental in establishing the whole idea of neighborhood greenways in Seattle, starting, actually, with an SDOT uh, staff study trip to Portland uh, a year ago, just exactly a year ago, in March 2011, uh, that included City Council Member Sally Bagshaw. Uh, so I wanted to thank you for your leadership on Greenways and making this a reality for us. So thank you. So good uh, and uh, Dong Ho Chang is, is new to SDOT, but not new to Seattle. He lives in Magnolia with his wife and two kids uh, and studied civil engineering at the UW. And he said he was turned on to traffic engineering by a faculty member, Fred Mannering, who's now at Purdue, who wrote the classic engineering textbook that only classic engineers could appreciate, which is the principles of highway engineering. So, it's expensive. I looked it up on Amazon. <laughs> 150 bucks for this book. I still use that book. <laughs> Um, and uh, Donko recently joined SDOT as the city's chief traffic engineer uh, after a stint as the Everett traffic engineer. And he was a member of the Seattle Bicycle Advisory Board while the Bicycle Master Plan was being crafted in 2006. And he's really excited to help us figure out how to make Greenways a reality. Uh, we're, or I'm really excited after talking to him about how you envision uh, safe and low stress transportation. And Anne Wudan is probably new to a lot of you, but she's not new to me. She was my PhD advisor. <laughs> so we have, uh, we have uh, had our ups and downs, but I'm so glad she's here tonight. <laughs> and Anne lives in Belltown, and she's an urban morphologist, which means that she studies neighborhood and street design, and also active transportation. And she's a professor of Oh, yes, yes, yes. Urban design and planning, architecture, landscape architecture, civil engineering, environmental engineering, public health, and epidemiology. <laughs> That's in lieu of uh, salary increases. <laughs> She's, she's most famous, I think, and I love that book, too, called Public Streets for Public Use, published many, many years ago, but a fabulous book, so if you get a chance to look it up, uh, check it out. $150. It's a... It's a... Second hand. So I wanted to say that the questions that I'm going to ask are questions that all those people who were just up talking helped to, to develop. They aren't questions, these aren't questions that I wrote, but they're questions that we all collectively wrote. I'm just up here asking them. Um, and this is the first one. You ready? <laughs> so, um, I, first of all, I want to kind of set the, set the stage. Do we agree that it is time for a large shift in Seattle uh, for more people who walk and more people who bike for everyday transportation. Do you think low stress streets is a part of making that shift happen? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of things quickly. Um, uh, I really wish I did have a 12 
billion dollar budget, and I, I didn't see too many of you wince. John, 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 who wrote this? I think John knows what a billion looks like. He's rumored to be rich. But uh, uh, so uh, the transportation infrastructure in the city of Seattle has a value of uh, 13 billion dollars. So I just just didn't want you to think, and, and the city budget is not 12 billion either. So, so you know. Uh, I, I have a master's in city planning, nowhere near a PhD, so I, I absolutely will defer to the PhD and the professor to my left and, uh, on any subject at all whatsoever. <laughs> um, politically co co connected, I, I don't know if anybody is. I have no idea how I got the job. It certainly wasn't political connections. Um, so I've been here two years, and uh, down Ho, uh, five, six weeks from beginning of February. Uh, and we've lived here, I've lived here 31 years, Don Ho, a fair amount of years. Neither of us was born in Seattle, or for that matter, in the United States. And uh, I think three of us on this stage have not been born in the United States. Uh, maybe Kathy was, I don't know. But uh, there's a lot of talent here, and not just in Portland, or Switzerland, or other places. So, uh, it, it is true, it was almost exactly a year ago that uh, I wanted the mayor and the city council to go with me to uh, Portland. I'd been to Portland in 2010 for Rail Revolution, which is an extraordinary event that, quite aside from the rail component and all of that, uh, it's the great child of a man named Earl Blumenauer. And uh, I don't know, how many of you have heard the name and know who he is? Uh, I, I expect nothing less. Uh, so, when you look at elected officials, not just on a local level, but at a national level, it's really hard to think of a person who's had a, a, a more prominent role and been a true believer from a very young age. I think he was an elected official at age 23. And um, it had a number of, of jobs and, and positions, and now, of course, he's a U.S. congressman. But that's when I got the idea, I gotta get a whole bunch of people down to Portland. And we had two, uh, this is on March 3rd and 4th, and we had two field trips. One was oriented to greenways, and one was oriented to uh, both light rail and uh, streetcar. And Sally Bagshaw took the greenways with uh, Greg Riesman and others. And uh, the rest is history. No. And uh, so she's been a great fan, and others too. But I think, uh, I never thought of blaming Don Ho for that first bike plan, which maybe <laughs> was okay for 2006, 2007, maybe, I don't know. I, but I think it's really time to recognize what we're saying here. Uh, what I want to drive home is that 27% of our land area is streets. And streets and right-of-ways are places. They're not pipes for cars. Mm. And we've got to get over that notion. And that's just a start. So I think that's a that's a deeply held philosophy in the department. And I think uh, are we perfect in carrying out that philosophy and everything we do? Not yet. But I think that's what the mayor and much of the council and certainly I and Don Ho. So that's the longest answer you're going to get to any of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. Still yes. That's the answer. Yes, that it's time for a large shift in how people walk and how people bike for everyday transportation. And you mentioned carrying out those those ways for using streets for other than pipes for cars. And we are getting seven miles of new greenways installed this year, uh, which I thank you very much for. Uh, and we want them to be great pilots that the rest of the city can come and see as great greenways. Um, how do you define a great low stress street that prioritizes people who are walking and biking and you know what? What's a success? Is it perceived safety, real safety? What makes uh, the intersection design and the streets themselves uh, really a successful greenway? Well, very, very quickly, and I'll leave it to Don Howard to elaborate. But both perceived and real safety, and it, the feeling of safety will make more people use it, and they'll be comfortable at all ages, age eighty, and feel like it's a welcoming place. It's a place of spiritual serenity. It's a place where you feel welcome, where you enjoy the pace, the edges, the trees, the people, and
and you're not worried about being um, involved in some kind of a collision. So I think how we get there and how we do it, there are all sorts of um, ways to do it, but I think that to me is underlying purpose. And it connects us, and it's not just connecting us as commuters, it's connecting us as neighbors, connecting us as recreators, connector, co connecting us as people doing a neighborhood shopping, a visit to the park, uh, going to look at birds, whatever it is, we, we connect it in many different directions and can get around easily, and um, that's kind of, to me, the, the basis, and uh, Dunho, I don't want to elaborate. So, uh, I, th I think the, uh, the key is that when you're on the street, how would you feel, um, uh, would you feel comfortable to be riding in there with your child, uh, with your mom, uh, in a group setting? Um, there are certain streets that are just inviting because of the character. There's low traffic volumes, people are out and about, that you're getting into your neighbors. Um, those are great examples of a low stress street. It's an, uh, it invites you to come out onto the street. Whereas other locations, uh, you know, it's really, like uh, Peter said, it's pipes for cars, and it, the facility isn't accommodating for human activity. And so we need to change that. And, and so we need to modify and really uh, tell uh, the drivers that this is actually a human space. So we need to do things like um, putting greenery around, uh, creating uh, uh, unexpected parking areas so that people uh, look for activity. And then when people do come out and there's more uh, people biking, it actually increases safety. What it does is it reinforces itself. Um, when, you, when you have more bikers and walkers, people are actually, when they're driving through, are looking for that activity. And so they slow down, um, they're more careful, and they're more respectful of, of, of the community. And so uh, the real key is though the, uh, the arterial crossing. Uh, those are, are uh, uh, really the, uh, the, the key things that we need to do to uh, improve the connectivity. If we can make this crossing safe, feel safe, and that uh, 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 easy to traverse, I think more people will come along those corridors and get to those destinations. Um, those are the locations that have the most uh, engineering challenges because if you, Think about our transportation network. Uh, those arterial streets are the locations where it uh, carries most of our traffic, and so we need to uh, be very thoughtful and uh, uh, create a safe environment that uh, 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 allows people to cross and then uh, discourages uh, tra uh, traffic to use these uh, uh, greenways as they cut through the route. So we want to be uh, we want to be very thoughtful and uh, use a lot of our resources to uh, key in the, on, on those intersections. Just quickly adding that it's self-reinforcing also in the sense that the more of us that are comfortable taking non-car transportation, whether it be bicycling or walking or transit, by definition, there'll be less driving and therefore it'll be safer yet. And so ideally, when you, when you get to the critical mass where we rule the streets with our people power or, or transit, that, that's a pretty good place to be. Thank you. Um, I mean, one of the things that I understand that the city council wants to do is incorporate the NACTO, which a lot of this audience will know what that means. They're engineering standards into the bicycle master plan update. I mean, we do want to see streets that are actually prioritized, not just at arterials, but along the length of the greenway. And th this is something that, that I think is of critical importance to, to a lot of people in this audience. Right, so you said two things. One is the National Association of City Transportation Officials which we belong to, and they just published a really nice book uh, which has those, those, those new standards. And as we do the uh, update to the bike master plan, that's going to be one of the many topics that will be covered, uh, what standards you use and, and lots of other things. But, and you probably have more questions about the bicycle Well, well it's, bicycle it's, it's, plan. It's, a, it's not so much about the bicycle master plan, but about prioritizing the, the, we want to have great pilots that totally prioritize pedestrians and bicycles along. And, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Uh, so, um, uh, I get it here. Um, <laughs> when, you, uh, when I'm riding uh, on that street uh, you know, with my family, I want to make sure, um, you know, along with, with your family as well, um, when you have a child who's not quite capable of understanding all the dangers, you want to make sure that you provide as much uh, safety for them so that uh, they use that route and, and feel comfortable. Uh, they, uh, and so, like you said, on these corridors where uh, we want to prioritize, what you're saying is on the side street, provide the stop sign, yeah, we can do that. Uh, but we need to look at each, each individual location carefully because 
Uh, there's other things that also are in that mix. Uh, uh, things like uh, visibility, you want to be able to make sure that the child, like when they're driving, uh, riding through, that they can perceive. Because um, you, can, you can think about a stop sign, it's just the sign. So you know, I, I, I carry this around, and you know, I've got all these signs. This is just a sign. Uh, and so uh, a lot of times when you're driving through, uh, this sign hopefully commands your attention and tells you that I need to do something. So when you're driving on the street and when you see a red, red traffic light, what do you do? You normally stop, right? Um, that, that's the key, that we it's just a, a device that tells the driver how to behave. And so we need to use these uh, devices in a careful way so that we get compliance from the drivers. Uh, once we start using them in a way that's really not effective, when, they, when there's no activity going on on the side street, and the stop sign there, we start getting that dangerous behavior because someone will say, well, you know, there's no one using the street, I'm just going to go right through. And that's the time when we have that critical uh, uh, collision and we want to avoid that. So we want to want to get that driver respect <coughs> to get that critical mass so that, you know, there's activity on the street and they're going to have to stop. And so uh, we want to use it in an appropriate way in the right location. We want to reinforce that safety by using that right tool. Okay, thanks. Um, one of the questions that we have is, you know, us as taxpayers. And we're looking to build greenways in part because they are one of the lowest cost options for providing safe infrastructure for people who walk and people who bike. Uh, and uh, we want to look at ways that these can be the least expensive ways uh, to build things. And we keep on hearing, maybe it's just stories, but that there are a lot cheaper ways to do uh, some of the infrastructure that we're paying a lot of money for. And I know it's complicated, very complicated, uh, but uh, there must be some kind of, and I should mention too, we're having another Greenways meeting on May the 3rd that's gonna be entirely about engineering questions. So this might be the last engineering question, uh, but uh, at the Capitol Hill Library, and then you said you might come to that, Domco, so we can talk about this more, but, but what are some of the ways that we don't have to pay $40,000 per intersection, for example, for, if we want to put curb ramps in all around, you know. I mean, it's not always that much, but it can be that much. How can we get people into cycle tracks that are inexpensive uh, so, and still safe? Yeah, so I, I think the key is that when we do these greenways, uh, we're recognizing that there's going to be uh, usage on it. Uh, so it's not just for the bicyclists, it's, it's for people who walk. And so we physically go out and, and review the pavement conditions we want to make sure that you know a lot of our roadways have been you know really uh, not maintained, and so if you have these huge potholes, you have uh, uneven uh, panels, um, those are not safe conditions. We want to address them. We want to go out and make sure that they're flat, that you can traverse without having uh, to <coughs> negotiate uh, the potholes. We want to make sure that the sidewalks as you go through, you got the uh, root, uh, intrusions in there, and you got the sidewalk panels. We're going to try to level those, and we want to uh, make sure that it's safe to walk along them, and that if you so that's what the community rates all about. So uh, you know, those are the minimum things we want to do. And then what you're talking about and, and the real cost is the arterial crossings and also the curb ramps. Um, I don't understand why curb ramps cost so much. You know, so uh, um, coming from Everett, uh, you know, the, you know, the, you, you know, there, there's a certain figure. And so you know, it, it takes a little bit of engineering. Uh, you, you can you can spend uh, quite a bit on just the design of it. But if you think about Kind of the prescriptive of you know what a curb ramp should do you know their uh, ADA uh, guideline says it has to be a certain slope you know and, and so that's where the real cost comes in where we have to do that real engineering design to try to meet the ADA minimum guideline a lot of times it's, it's, it's effort that's almost uh, unnecessary because uh, in certain locations are fairly standard so you know uh, we can do some of that cost uh, other locations there's drainage involved mm -hmm. very expensive you know you have to go out and you have physically uh, put in a pipe um, and tie into a drainage structure to, to, to make sure that the, the curb ramp doesn't pull water, so it's not usable, okay. right? And so um, we have to we have to make sure to make sure that what we put in there is usable. The big cost is at the arterial crossing. So um, if you have a location where we're trying to get a safe crossing for the family, um, and if it's a it's a four lane roadway, you know we're not going to be uh, we're, we're going to make sure that it's it's a safe location. So. Uh, in those locations, you know, the ultimate uh, 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 tool that we can use is a traffic light. Uh, they're expensive, yeah. yeah. So, you know, there's quite a bit of infrastructure involved <coughs> in a traffic light. And so, 
so we're we're gonna we're gonna talk yeah. a lot more about that so, in, in, in May. Yeah, so we'll you know we'll look at all the all the options that's available. Uh, if it's, it's the bottom section, there there's plenty of gaps. Uh, we could do some intermediate measures and some creative yeah. thinking. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, but uh, if we're talking about school kids crossing there and the young kids, uh, we want to be very careful and thoughtful and we want to use the right tools. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, this, is, this is more of a Peter, Peter question. And it has been our experience that the responsibility for greenways within uh, the Seattle Department of Transportation is scattered among many different groups making coordination and communication a challenge. Uh, including planning, outreach, implementation, and evaluation. Is there a way to streamline some of those activities within SDOT? I'm a little bit aware of that, and um, I think that with, uh, there'll be two new people in that Don Ho, who's been here since February, but also the head of the traffic management division uh, recently uh, announced his leaving. So I think as part of having two key individuals in a new position, I think it's fair to look at how exactly we're organized. And I know that in other places, or even in Seattle, where at one point there was a name, a focal name, that when you thought bikes, you, you thought of one person, largely. And uh, for various reasons, we're not exactly in that position. You know, so if it's Portland, it was or is uh, Greg, and uh, and I don't know if in Seattle it exactly was Peter Lagaway, but you know maybe not precisely. But I think the point is that citizens and others should not have to navigate a bureaucratic maze. So it really helps if we knew that um, you know how the different processes work together uh, and um, make it easier for a program to go from a grassroots idea to a project on the ground. So I think I think that's a fair that that that's a fair expectation that we could improve that. Okay. I'll send you this question. Um, bicycle master plan outreach opportunities. This is the question. Uh, people who don't yet ride bikes uh, probably won't show up to bike planning meetings. And we're not just talking about kind of the race and social justice initiative uh, here, but although that's really important, but we're talking about people who are reluctant and willing, but wary, 8 to 80, exactly the kinds of people that we want to start walking and biking for everyday transportation. Um, how are we going to reach those people? So today at lunch, uh, for 12 to 1, both uh, Don Ho and I, and Don, who you met uh, earlier to talk a little bit about summer streets, attended a uh, pretty full room of various colleagues in the department. And granted, the dimension was the race and social justice. Because we look at everything we do in the department from that filter and make sure that what we do is equitable and recognizes quiet, silent voices. And But in that conversation, it certainly came up that various people who don't bike, whether they be from minority communities or non-English speaking people, etc., that how do we know what they could do and would do if given uh, better facilities? How do we hear those voices? So we had various ideas around the room. Uh, I don't know that we came up with any perfect solutions. Uh, we also had the person who's the project manager for the bike master plan, uh, a man named uh, Kevin O'Neill. And, uh, and his teammate on that, uh, Sarah Zara is her name. And we were just throwing around ideas. And I don't know that anybody had a uh, perfect solution. In fact, one of, the, <laughs> one of the points of view that was perhaps um, jarring was that um, many people, and, and this was by one of the people in, in our group who's, you know, maybe more tuned to uh, minority communities saying that in some ways uh, biking is perceived as elitist or gentrification. And, and it, it, it wasn't so much that this person felt that. It was more like this person had been exposed to that point of view. And kind of made us think. I mean, the purpose of having these lunches is we learn from each other, get to hear different points of view. 
So whichever community it is that isn't currently biking, how do we make it, uh, how do we bring them to the table? Uh, we, did, we did speak about the elderly, and we were talking about uh, where we have, um, working through the Seattle Housing Authority, where they, they might know more concentrations of elderly housing. So that being an example of, of one group. But uh, if, you, if you people have any ideas, we're welcome to any ideas on this, because outreach is an integral part of all of our plans. And, uh, and, and frankly, uh, we've had conversations with both the Transportation Committee Chair, Tom Rasmussen, and Sally Bagshaw, uh, partly because of her interest in the Greenways topic, but also because of her parks uh, hat chair, um, about how we do outreach. And one of the thoughts that they both had was to uh, avail ourselves of people in the community who've been organized, um, and whether it be you, whether it be uh, Bicycle Alliance, whether it be uh, Cascade, whatever, but again, uh, all these groups of present people are biking now, and how do you reach an audience that's not coming to these meetings, that's not at the bike shops, that's not in the SDP, that's not, how do we, and, and we're not sure. Uh, you know, we talked about using churches and using supermarkets, bulletin boards, and things like that, but um, it, 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 any ideas you have would be very welcome. Did you want to add anything? Uh, we did talk about uh, reaching those uh, parks where, uh, uh, where the community congregates, you know, having multi-language uh, uh, flyers so that, um, so that we can uh, reach, reach that, that community uh, who don't speak the uh, English as a first language. Um, and the community centers and libraries, you know, those are kind of the traditional. Also, uh, reaching out to the bike, uh, uh, bike shops, uh, where a lot of the uh, people actually come to. And then we also wanted to focus on uh, reaching the, uh, the, uh, the female population as well. So uh, again, uh, uh, we want to uh, uh, get as a diverse uh, 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 opinion as possible on, uh, on our master plan so that uh, uh, we get this equitable network uh, set up and then uh, uh, make sure that the uh, prioritization and the, the project that we build is transparent so we can all see uh, how we selected this project, how it's equitable to each of the community, and how the network connects to the larger uh, larger community. I'm just curious, how many people out in the audience use a bike for everyday transportation? So, maybe half, maybe. Who, do, who doesn't? Raise your hand if you don't use a bike for everyday transportation. <laughs> so, more than half. Okay. Um, so I think Greenways are reaching people that don't use a bike for everyday transportation, which is who we want to reach because they want it. They're here because they want to. They want to maybe start doing that. Um, outreach and education. Let's see. Oh, one thing is we have to collect cards for questions. So if whoever's collecting cards with the questions on them, I want to do that, and we have like one or two more questions. Oh, greenways can be green. They can and should serve pedestrians, kids playing in the street, they can be used for stormwater retention, public art, park-like amenities, even tiny cottage businesses. Um, how do we develop these beyond the roadway amenity plans? Do you have any of your own kind of creative ideas for the public use of some of that 27% of your, your uh, or our city property? Uh, we'd like to do some kind of interdepartmental work and, and very kind of holistic, you know, transforming the street work uh, as we develop greenways. Do you have any? So we've, we've certainly had experience working with Seattle Public Utilities and the wastewater people and figuring out more creative ways of dealing with uh, stormwater, uh, whether it be called rain gardens or other things like that. Uh, again, there are examples of that throughout and people who work in that field have ideas on how uh, that can be done. I think we, maybe, I know there are people here from Ballard for sure, and um, we, I, I don't know if we had the greatest success in trying to get going on that. There were issues with the rain garden concept, and, but the two departments work well together, and um, so 
green infrastructure, which is, again, much more than just uh, you know, the, 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 the conventional pipes, uh, hopefully it is in the future. And so we want to take any opportunity where the two departments can um, uh, work together. And, and that's, by the way, one of the things that sometimes determines the timing of specific projects. So that ideally, we're not coming back to a neighborhood and redoing things like, you know, it's, it's a greenway this year, and oh, next year, we're coming back with something else. And uh, to the extent possible, we, we hold up our capital needs over, you know, five to 10 year period and coordinate so that we're uh, perhaps having outreach in the community at the same time and then hopefully planning at the same time in a coordinated, comprehensive fashion, and then constructing it at the same time so as to be least uh, disruptive. I think uh, one of the uh, greatest examples of partnership is uh, East uh, Valley Community. Uh, there, uh, uh, Peter from the, from the community developed this grand vision of working to having Northwest and just saw this big right away uh, that was uh, fairly underutilized, the people were parking everywhere in the middle, and uh, decided to really take action um, and created this vision of a park boulevard. Uh, what a great concept, having this linear park. Uh, so think about it from, you know, all the way from the water. I don't know if I'll ever get to that point, but at least from Market Street all the way to, yeah. All right, so, uh, so if you think about, you know, creative uses, you still uh, have a space for uh, vehicle travel, but then you have this amenity along the street that's for the community. Uh, you can have a very nice cycle track on, on, uh, on one side that connects to the Greenway on 58th Street there. Uh, and what a great inviting uh, a vision. So uh, uh, right from Market Street where all the, uh, the high density uh, uh, transit activity happens, you can, you can uh, uh, have all the uh, students uh, that are uh, living in the community uh, walk along this boulevard uh, to school and back. Um, you know, so uh, partnering, partnering with parks, I think that was a, that's a, that was a key uh, uh, ingredient. But it really takes the community to come, come forward and say, this is what we want, um, and engaging the parks and, uh, and, and, and the department um, to uh, carry that vision forward. So. so just two projects that I'm quickly aware of, and there are more, but we're working on, on Bell Street, and we're going to have it's how much it is, but you know, but this is with parks in the right of way, uh, making for a completely different streetscape. Uh, we have the uh, Lake to Bay loop that we're working on, uh, Thomas Street. So there are any number of examples, and, and there'll be more. There'll be more. And you know, one of the things I just want to put in a plug for why this is all good is um, if you want evidence that this is good for economic development, if this is good for a thriving city, uh, it could do a lot worse than just look back a, a couple of weeks when Amazon came to the city and said that the reason they want to build two Columbia Center size complexes, in, in more than two buildings, but basically the equivalent of those two, uh, uh, two big towers, is because their workforce wants it to be this kind of a community where you can bicycle, we can walk, we can use transit, and not a suburban setting with a sea or seas of parking. So I, I think that was a very welcome sign uh, to us that we are on the right track. Okay, I'm gonna go into some of the, the questions here. Public outreach is critical to public acceptance of greenways. Um, is the neighborhood, our neighborhoods expected to do a lot of this public outreach for Greenways as they're built? When you say are neighborhoods expected, or are you saying should we do it with the neighborhood? I, 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 I'm not sure the, the <laughs> emphasis of the question well, should neighborhoods be expected. I, I think maybe because a lot of the Greenways are going in. I don't know. I think the expect, I, well, I'll just answer. Our, I think when we're going to go out, with a suggested corridor. Number one, if it came to us from a group that's been working, we'll assume there's been a lot of outreach, but I think any facility like that would have to have acceptance from the immediate abutters and the neighborhood to make it successful.
because they'll be in the front stoops of the Greenway, and hopefully they will benefit the most, and they will want it the most. So I think we would want strong community support. Okay. These are really great questions, guys. Thank you. There are way too many of them, so I'm going to type them up and send them to you. Uh, but let's get through some of them. What are your plans to measure if Greenway designs are working? What will you do if existing designs are not working, are not proving effective? Uh, I certainly have ideas, but I want Don Moe to talk at least as much as I. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's some concrete measures we can, uh, we can look at to see if the uh, Greenway is working. Yeah, just go out the street and see if it's being used. I mean, that's a, that's a really good measure, isn't it? Uh, if it's no one's using it, then we're doing something wrong. Uh, if people are uh, using that to uh, uh, as a cut through rep, we're doing something wrong. And so uh, we want to see uh, usage. We want to use increased usage over time. And we want to see safety. So we want no collisions and decre decreased collision rates overall. So we want a lot of people cycling. We want a lot of people walking. We want a lot of engagement in the in, in, the, in these uh, corridors, and we want collisions to go down so that we don't see any, any collisions on, on these because there's so much activity going on, people are being very careful. Uh, what, what will we do if we uh, see that it's not working? Um, we're going to learn from our mistakes, right? So uh, if the corridor that we put in um, isn't the right corridor, then we need to pick it out and put it at the right lo location where people want to use it. Um, if there's something that uh, we're not providing that's, that's not attractive to the community so that they can use it, um, we're not doing our job. So we need feedback from you as well. Uh, when these corridors go in and tell us, you know, this location, you know, th this particular treatment is, is, is not effective. Uh, you know, I can't see around this uh, intersection, you know, uh, uh, so we'll, you know, we definitely want those. Uh, and then uh, we can measure uh, very easily the usage. So we do some counts uh, as far as uh, uh, be able to uh, see how many folks are using it on, on these locations. Uh, we can look at vehicle usage as well and see if there's actually an increase. So if you look at a lot of these proposed locations, there's actually tubes out there already. We want to do some before counts, see what the current base level line is of uh, vehicle usage, uh, what the uh, bicycle usage is. And then once the green one is, is implemented, we're ex expecting that the uh, vehicle usage will stay the same, but that the uh, increase in bicycles uh, and the speeds will go down. So this is, a, this is an idea that I like a lot. Have you ever considered engaging school kids in transportation outreach? They are one of my target audiences for this concept, for Greenways. They're often thoughtful and observant, and missing usually from the transportation debate. So that came up today at the meeting that I cited before at, at the noon hour, and it was brought up just for that reason. It was also brought up because we were uh, concerned with reaching people who do not speak English that well, but the kids might, and the kids will hear it from us, talk to their parents in their language, and thereby uh, spread the word. And we all know that kids were instrumental in um, spreading recycling and in motivating parents. So the same way, if kids can be the motivators, uh, we, that, that'd be wonderful. Um, do you think there will be an overall connecting greenway system in Seattle? A uh, network? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, we obviously have challenges of topography, but I'm not sure that to be successful, it has to be completely connected. I, I, I can think of greenways well, that let would me, be... Let me actually rephrase that, because I think this group probably represents not greenway so much, but low stress. I mean, people want to be able to safely have prioritized walking and biking ways to get around. So a greenway can run into a cycle track, and that's just fine with us. If you say that, yes. <laughs> I was having, having a conversation earlier uh, about, you know, if we have our uh, uh, bicycle master plan, we put in, uh, you know, uh, all these, uh, uh, bicycle facilities, and we actually learn from each one. So, you know, as, as we do more of these, uh, we realize that, you know, there's some things that we can do to make them better and safer. Dexter is a prime example where we said, you know, uh, there's a lot of buses going along this corridor. What can we do to make that better? So we, we're learning as we go. Um, 
these locations where we currently have bicycle bicycle lanes, it may not be the most inviting for families as well. So uh, as you get more usage, it could be prioritized that we want to do something extra again. Um, so uh, if those locations um, we want to look at to increase usage. If you want to triple the number of cyclists, we're going to have to do that. So we're going to have to upgrade that facility, uh, put some protection in there, make it a cycle track. Um, so you know, those are the. Uh, challenges when we do our bicycle master plan update we need your input to make sure that we have um, the right uh, prioritization uh, put in so that uh, we can apply what your values are uh, when we uh, spend our resources thanks this this question amuses me some really great stenciled graphics arrived mysteriously in my ballard neighborhood recently pictograms of a person walking a dog and a parent with a lad on bikes. They clearly designate that something's different with this street. They're not shadows. And paint is very inexpensive. What would it take to make this concept an official part of all neighborhood greenways? I like those stencils. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I think uh, that's part of the, uh, the branding of the greenways. I think we, uh, we're open to uh, some creative uh, designs. Um, we, we want we want the signs to really uh, mean something to people who see it. So uh, when they see that uh, um, that symbol on the roadway, it's kind of like a, the, the street painting that we currently do. It, it tells people that you're actually in an environment that's not really a, uh, just a regular roadway that you need to really uh, pay attention. So yes, definitely we're, we're open to looking at um, designs. Um, paint doesn't last very long, uh, so especially that. Exactly, especially chalk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I got a bunch of them my tire. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so we, we want to make sure um, when when we do uh, uh, the, the the symbology for this greenway that uh, we don't have to come out and you know and repaint it. So, um, even though paint is inexpensive to initially install, um, it is expensive in, expensive to maintain. So we want to you know use more durable type uh, materials so that we don't have to come out as often. Um, this is a question about outreach again. We would love to see Greenway projects organized in conjunction with neighborhood community clubs, pedestrian cycling traffic, limiting car traffic, access to transit, parks, schools, libraries. Those are community club concerns. Just a comment. Um, another one about schools and parents and bike racks. Um, this is saying, what are your barriers in SDOT? Um, you know, who is in the city is resisting your efforts to make streets more friendly to non-drivers? What main arguments do you use to influence them to change their minds? What do you say what, about the benefits of complete streets? Well, complete streets was passed nine to nothing by our city council, and we, you know, we, we think we have well-established policies. The barriers are when, um, I, I don't have a complete list, but just like with transit, whenever you start treading on parking, whenever you start treading on car lanes, there are people who come out of the woodwork, and, uh, or it's not really the woodwork, I mean, it's, there's still a lot of them who, you know, think that this is about you should park anywhere you want. You should. You should. I mean, uh, you know, I, my experience is perhaps more with um, bus lanes. But when we're putting in rapid ride, which is you know somewhat improved transit, it's not perfect, but it's certainly an improvement. And we have to put in bus exclusive lanes. I mean, there are people who come and glued, and constantly are pressuring me to allow this and allow that, and they get an exception, and Magnolia is different. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes, Magnolia is different, I agree. Uh, you know, uh, but that's what happens, and there are a lot of them. And, it, and so, if, if the greenways are gonna start colliding with parking, uh, you, you'll have to come out, because there'll be other people saying, that we're making their life miserable and so on. And then in response to um, what would be my arguments, it would be that people want it, that we do, we do not want to be in the same place 
we were 10, 20 years ago. We, it's not sustainable. Greenhouse gas emissions are not gonna get better if we think we can keep doing the same thing over and over again. It just isn't gonna work. When you look at the growth numbers for the city of Seattle, you can't keep doing the same thing. So we've got to do, we've got to give people the options and I think that argument just has to be made over and over again uh, by people like you and others who get it. And um, that's what it's going to take. So we do have council members who understand this, and probably all of them do. Uh, what's hard is when other forces come out, uh, when the freight community comes out and you know tries to say that well, what we're trying to do is in their way and and they do cite some valid arguments about safety and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, it's, we're trying our best. And uh, uh, I think with a bike, I, I actually think that the bike master plan that's done in 2012 will be a very interesting contrast to uh, the one that was done in 2006 and adopted in uh, 2007. It'll really, really be interesting to see if, uh, People get it now more than they might have uh, before. So uh, I have a uh, actually a, a uh, positive view on the greenway because we actually want parking on the street. We want that friction. We want the narrowing of the roadway. So it actually uh, creates a, a, almost a desire for people to do more of them. Uh, so uh, you know, we, we want that street to be slower. Who, who wouldn't want to live in a street? Uh, that has calm traffic, right? So I, I think Greenway is a great, great tool to uh, build our own network, and I don't think we're going to have as much. Arterial crossing will be the, the key location, because some locations we're going to have to restrict access, because we want, we want to make sure that it's not a cut-through route. So uh, we can start off with signing, we can do physical challenges, changes, you know, but uh, you know, those will be the big challenges for us. But the Greenway itself, I think, uh, is, is very doable. We're not going to have that much resistance. Okay, uh, this is another outreach idea, which is, um, and I'm sure you do some of this, but, but convince healthcare providers uh, that they need to be uh, involved in your active transportation efforts. So we, absolutely, and I think um, when we talk about alternative modes of transportation, health is a huge angle. So the ability to walk and bi ride bicycle uh, is, is a huge step toward uh, reducing obesity. And Dr. Fleming, who is the, um, I, I don't know his exact title, but he's, but we, we have a health district that's a city and county health district, and he's the head of that. And he's been very, very forceful in saying that uh, this is very much for the health of the community. And it makes us healthier, it lowers medical costs, insurance costs, it makes us more competitive, I mean, there's so many things to be said about it. Uh, I think it's criminal to not do it. Okay. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time left, and there are more questions here, and there's probably more people scribbling more questions out there. But I am going to have somebody or me type them up, and I will send them to you, and, and then you can enjoy them. And, <laughs> and, and maybe, maybe we can post some of the answers if, if there are some of the answers somewhere. Um, but I'd like to leave enough time for our listener observer Anne to respond, but before she does, um, I wanted to ask you, the, the, the title of this evening was A Legacy of Greenways. And if we look at greenways as not just greenways, but low stress infrastructure that people 8 to 80 feel safe to walk on and bike on, what would you like to be your legacy of Greenways? Well, uh, we three weeks ago, I think, we released um, or rolled out something called our 2012 Action Agenda for Transportation. And it's on the web. If you go to SDOT, I think if you put that in, you'd find it. And clearly, that's something that we already recognize by name in here. And I'd like us to get to a point where, you know, people don't just point to Portland or to Vancouver. Vancouver's done some good things. Vancouver, BC. Maybe Vancouver, 
Um, and so, um, you know, I'd like us to be in the forefront of doing a lot of these things. And, and, and there are times when we compare it pretty well to Portland. I mean, it's just, the, the, the so, you know, there's so many nice things. And for many reasons, they were ahead of us. And Earl Blumenauer probably gets credit for 80% of it. Uh, but it's to be, it's to do, keep doing the right thing and recognize that alternative transportation is, is healthy, it's the right thing to do, whether it's bikes or it's walking or it's transit. And I'd like, you know, us to start with seven miles and, you know, and, and keep increasing that number and take every opportunity that we can to, um, to have a tremendous network. This is Anne. So what, what can I say? Um, I mean, I see, as, as a listener, I see, uh, you know, two factions just spatially divided, right? So we are on the stage and then uh, the people there. Um, <laughs> the more people here, the there. <laughs> so you should be feeling good. You have the majority, uh, and so I see a lot of ideas out there, and a lot of enthusiasm, and a lot of uh, actually willpower to get you know something going, which means that uh, in the people who also, by the way, have to you have to manage many more people than you have here when you go to work. But these two people, at least you know you have some support for what you're trying to do. So you know. It's almost an ideal world at, at this level, right? So you have a lot of energy in the community. Maybe you don't have enough money, you never have enough money, but you also, I think when I look at the, um, the responses to the question, um, excuse me, um, about you know, your first uh, uh, statement either, which was you know, very good, saying, hey, we have 25%, 27% of our land area that's in streets, and uh, streets are not just for cars. So you know that you have you know, a leader here who's you know, on your side in general. And then um, you people from the community, communities sort of come and make different demands. And very clearly, there are a lot of conflicts. Because you know, not only is it 27% of the land, but it's our land, right? So it's not my lot, my house, it's our street. And, um, so the conflicts sort of come from you know, people who don't want to share. And essentially, uh, we all, I think in this room here, we all for what's called non, used to be called non-motorized, low stress streets. So the, the history is not on our side because in the last 40, 50 years, we've been uh, giving priority to cars. And so now we have to backpedal, literally, uh, and then regain that space, and it's it's a struggle. It's going to be a struggle. <clears throat> so, uh, but I see generally, you know, these two sides here um, having the right context to go ahead and uh, recapture, change the trend, reverse the trend, and recapture the street space for people. Um, then what's interesting when uh, you listen to the questions, of course, there's a lot of questions about safety. Uh, and that's a big, big one. Um, one thing about safety and looking at, for instance, collisions, uh, it's not a good way to uh, evaluate the short term uh, you know, part of a, of a program, any program. Because you might have you know, one death in the green green uh, way, I hate to say that, but you might have one uh, that may or may not be related to the fact that it's a green, green way. And essentially, if you want to look at uh, the real safety and uh, study it, you have to look at it for over 10 years because collisions, even uh, minor collisions with no injuries, are um, you know, um, so-called rare events. And so, uh, you know, when I know that, and we all know that, that you know, one funeral is, is enough to change some of the world, but uh, the fact is that you need more than that to really evaluate the value of the street. So that's going to be an issue. Uh, and I think that the, the way you resolve that problem is to, 
continue working together, uh, not only in good faith, but also sort of very uh, systematically to uh, keep that notion of safety. But if you start counting too much, uh, you're going to have problems. You're also going to have problems when you start counting, um, you know, the use of the streets. Because, um, you know, think of it this way. We use double standards. Um, in, when we look at a street that's uh, empty of cars, uh, and not here empty of cars, we say it's great. It is full of cars. Oh my gosh, congestion. This is terrible. We have to do something about it. But then when we go to the low-stress street and we see nobody on it, walking or biking, we say, nobody's using it. Or when we see an empty bus, we say, why is this bus there? It's empty. We never say that when we see an empty street. Most people say, oh, this is great. So I think we have to talk about this. I don't remember that one. <laughs> yeah. I keep you know, talking about that. This is a double standard. And we can laugh which is the first step, I think, we can laugh about it, how silly we are. And then we've got to do something about it. So I'm against, you know, counting before and after. Uh, I know that it's very popular. Um, <laughs> and actually, um, I benefit from it because they give me money to do research counting before and after. <laughs> but uh, I'm very open about it. Do not count. I mean, what for? I mean, first of all, when do you count? So you do a greenway, do you count like the next morning? No. Or maybe yes, because everybody's going to be in the street. Two weeks later, maybe fewer people, and then you count in the winter and there's nobody, and so on and so on, right? So counting works, but you have to do it maybe over five years, and then reevaluate, and so on. All right. Um, I have a lot to say about engineering. I think there's too much emphasis on the engineering and too little on um, education. And um, it's not education of just uh, the bicyclist or the non-bicyclist, but it's education of the whole uh, transportation public. And so, you know, for instance, the share road, there was not enough discussion about the share road. There still is not enough. And so now you have all politics, the pro and against share roads. It doesn't work, doesn't it work? And the fact of the matter is that nobody knows, really whether they work, whether they're great or not. But we have to talk about it and we have to go out into the general public so that they know what you guys are trying to do because you're trying to do good things. You're not doing share hours to make things worse, obviously, but you have to be out there explaining why it works or doesn't work and then people have to you know, discuss that. And the same, I think, with the Greenways. It has to be a, a, a forever dialogue uh, with goodwill. With good so in the outreach, uh, you know, it's interesting to me to hear about the questions about outreach and, um, you know, how we deal with it. To me, the big uh, outreach that we need to do are people who drive. They just don't understand what we're trying to do in the city with the bicyclists. And I encounter these people every day. Some of them are even my friends. You know? <laughs> and uh, it's really interesting. People, I would say 80% of people in this city, adults, have no idea of what the city of Seattle is doing. And so you can, you know, we all know good and bad stories about our cyclists, right? And uh, so you can choose. Uh, so that part of outreach is very important. The, um, you know, the middle, upper middle class, regular folks who just never think about these things and then they see all these crazy cyclists on the road and they don't understand what's happening. We need to talk to them very seriously. The other outreach is um, within, we did tend in Seattle, we're very neighborhood oriented, which has been a strength in the city. But then each neighborhood is sort of doing its own thing and we need to work across neighborhoods, which is the good thing about uh, uh, the Greenway. Um, Schools, the big issue in school is, um, I think it'd be really good for DOT to involve more, you know, regular kids, especially, I would say, uh, teenage boys who love to bicycle. Why don't they bicycle more often? Because the parents don't want to let them, right? So that's a great audience of teenage boys, uh, you know, they work in bike shops, they, they do, you know, they second-hand bikes, they just, I mean, it's the pre-car, 
right? <laughs> Craziness, and you want to catch them. And oh, and I want to add something about that there. The, the other thing that research is showing that's really exciting is if children have had a multimodal experience in their childhood, they're much more likely to be using buses or any kind of transport later on in, in life. And so working with these kids uh, would be really important. Um, we can go on and on, but I'm trying to, I'm supposed to summarize. <laughs> Encourage you? Yes. <laughs> okay, if, um, I mean, the, uh, the two, I think, silent uh, items that should be brought to the table in this discussion is um, speed and uh, traffic speed, that is, and also some bicycling speed. I mean, some, some of the bicyclists I live downtown and, you know, they go down 40 miles an hour down. Second Avenue, and uh, you know, so it's not just the cars, but um, what they've done in that's well known that in Germany and Netherlands, those are countries that we have like 30 years of data, and they um, reduce speeds I think 20 kilometers, so that's about 15 miles an hour on on uh, neighborhood streets, and they have reduced actually their casualties to a very very low level. They have nationwide half. Uh, the casualties that we have uh, in this country. They've done, done that and they saw, you know, a progress every year. So we do speed, and I know that's hard to do, right? Because everybody's for it when it's in your street and they want, you know, the street next to it that they want to use, they want no speed restriction on that. But I, I think that's something that can come from the top, and in the end, everybody will be happy. If the DOT comes in and says, look, these are streets, you know, all the streets in the neighborhood 15 miles now are done. And people will say, but, and so on, and then you have enough argument to sort of say, well, do you want, you know, your neighbor's kids to be in? Do you want this? So speed. And uh, the other one, the other big one is enforcement. Right. You know, because we can put, and uh, people will think about it. So enforcement. And we were talking with Kathy, we need, uh, we need somebody from uh, the police department in this, you know, or the dog with them, because um, they have children too. Some of them buy bicycles. So a lot of them buy Yeah, all right. So what did I forget about with the very boy? Oh, do you know that there's, a, uh, I was trying to remember Manly, but uh, um, don't, don't go with, with them. The, the four E's of, of uh, transportation, what are they? I'm going to fail this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. The four E's, so it's engineering. Education, engineering, yeah. enforcement. Encouragement. Yeah, it's true. And I never remember the encouragement, and I don't really know what it means. But it's part of the four E's, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that is like the mantra of uh, transportation engineering. So encouragement. You remember that yes. now. So you're going to use that for encouragement. Oh. It's the only way to go. The only way to go is to have green light streets. So that was your encouragement <laughs> and your encouragement. The only way to go is to have green light streets or greenways or low stress streets. And thank you very much for supporting us from the top. And thank you very much for your comments. And thank you very much for being here this evening. And uh, I don't know if there's any last things that Robin needs to say. As our host, she may. And, but thank you, thank you all.